All right. We've got Zach Bivens on the left, a very well-known name, popular name in Disney Lorcana. I love Zach Bivens for his ingenuity. Every single time we see him in a Disney Lorcana challenge, I feel like he brings something interesting to the table. And then we also have Shane uh, Severs there on the right. I believe Zach Bivens is playing an Amber a Emerald deck, and then Shane is playing a Steel Sapphire deck. Yeah, anybody who's watched these streams is familiar with Zach. He's played in both the previous challenges and placed very highly. I do not think he's cracked in the top 16, though. So something I think he's fighting for today. Um, and yeah, with this deck that uh, that I think a lot of people talked about uh, this Amber Emerald deck. Uh, it had some tools in, set, uh, in this latest set in Ursula's Return that made it kind of a viable deck in the competitive scene. And everybody was waiting for it to kind of like break into the mainstream. And it never quite did, although it's always been lurking as a deck that has from promise. It has. It's been a bit of a sleeper deck. And to be honest, if anybody's going to be able to crack it, I think Zach is one of the players who can. We see him on turn one playing this Diablo, getting a good look at Shane's hand, taking some time to study it too. This is how you know you're playing against a good player. They don't just look at your hand and say, okay, you can take it back. He really takes time to memorize the cards that he's going to have to play around with Shane and then immediately playing a uh, Bare Necessities to now that he knows what's in Shane's hand. Yep. Knows that he can play the Bear Necessities and potentially get rid of a card. Looking at that Baboom, wanting to keep that Diablo uh, nice and healthy and not banished. <laughs> yeah, I mean, took a look, knew exactly what it had, knew that Baboom had to go and played right into it. Um, and now the Diablo, of course, exerted and going to start giving Zach uh, extra cards on Shane's turn. And we did see Shane play that Fortisphere on turn one, a great card that just says draw a card when you play it an item. Combos very well with a card I'm sure we will see later, Hiram Flaversham, that can banish an item. And then here we see Shane playing a Popsicle as well and then inking for the turn and passing. Yeah, and I think, I'm not sure Zach took a card off the Popsicle there. It's one thing to know. I think it's a May ability on the Diablo, so you can guess whether or not to take it. Um, and uh, Zach perhaps choosing not to take it off the Popsicle there. Inking a Kita. I think that's the second big Kita that we've seen him ink so far. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, I imagine seeing these Kitas in this deck, you know, we talked about how uh, this is a deck people looked at. Under the Sea is a new mm -hmm. song card utilizing the key, uh, Sing Together mechanic that was new to Ursula's Return. Um, and Under the Sea, I love this card because it sends all of the opposing characters to the bottom of their deck under a certain strength. So I'm led to believe that, or if I had to guess, we, since we see this Kita and we know that Songs is uh, something this deck wants to play, I would be surprised if there's a couple under the sea roaming around. I, I wouldn't be surprised either. You know, this deck is kind of a control deck. Um, Emerald is not, Emerald and Amber are not two colors that are, that are really known for their board control, except... Uh, Emerald does have a lot of cards that bounce cards back to opponents' hands. And there are some cards in Emerald that do this. Um, there's the Muses that are out there. Um, we don't talk about Bruno does this as an action. Um, Under the Sea is another one, as you highlighted. These are all cards that allow you to control the board through bouncing cards back to your opponent's hand. And as you pointed out, Kita sets up for that Under the Sea card very, very nicely. So um, Zach uh, possibly angling to do that in the late game. And oh my goodness, we see a pretty big Ursula Deceiver being played here. Shane revealing to grab your sword. A very threatening card against this board state with the Prince John and the Diablo, both only having two willpower. So they would be banished if Shane plays grab your sword next turn, which he absolutely can. He has the fish and quill, which means as long, well, as long as the fish and quill stays around till the next turn, then Shane can ink any card from his hand, meaning that he would be able to ink up to five, play the Scriber Sword, and banish both the Prince John and the Diablo. I think we see Zach Bivens questing with both of them here, knowing that they're probably not long for this world. That is true. Painting the Roses Red, another card that we don't see terribly often in the competitive meta. Uh, not blue, not green, not aquamarine. We're painting the Roses Red. <laughs> um, this card is another card that manipulates your opponent's character strengths, again, playing into that Kida uh, play later on. I'm definitely starting to see a theme here with Zach Bivens deck. It cares a lot about uh, reducing strength. And as you mentioned earlier, there's quite a few ways you can control the board with different amber and emerald actions and characters that care about strength specifically. So I'm eager to see what else Zach pulls out of this, just because, like you said, Painting the Roses Red isn't a card we typically see. It, I love that it replaces itself. You get to draw a card when you play the card, but otherwise you don't see the negative strength part of this action used very frequently. No, that's true. 
see what's here for turn five play. I do want to talk a little bit about Shane. That We've talked a lot about Zach and what he's trying to do. Shane, um, I would argue we're seeing some of the cards that he wants to be playing in the early game, getting items on the board for Hiram, um, and then a fishbone quill out to allow him to put extra ink in the ink well, really getting that resource advantage that this deck wants to build. But Zach is, has really been putting some hand pressure on Shane here, getting rid of, you know, what, three cards, I think, at this point? Uh, yeah. from his hand, which is, that's ink that Shane wants to be putting in the inkwell um, and uh, and eventually play a whole new world. So um, Shane's kind of on the back foot here just with, with his his hand disadvantage. Right, I think Shane's especially hurting because we haven't seen a Flaversham or uh, sometimes players like to play a whole new world in this deck as well just as a way to refill your hand. One of my, Sapphire Steel is a deck that I love to watch being played because of their ability to get ink into their ink well very quickly. We see Fishbone Quill being played. That's another way that Shane is removing cards from his hand. So it's hurting him even more. And like you mentioned, Zach Bibbins also taking cards out of Shane's hand. He doesn't have any cards in hand now, but typically the Sapphire Steel deck wants to ramp into a five cost character, which you can then sing a whole new world. And we don't see that or a Hiram in play. Yeah, yeah, and here we see another card that we don't see terribly often in the in the meta. Although it's one that people are were excited about when the set started. It's Cricky, uh, Lucky Cricket from Mulan. Uh, this is a three four with three lore, and when you play this character, other characters, uh, your other characters get plus three strength this turn. Uh, so not something that Zach utilized there, but a three lore character on the board now uh, threatening to gain Zach some lore pretty quickly. I actually love this card personally because I think it plays a great offensive and defensive role as a card when you play the card like you mentioned you're boosting the strength of all of your other characters which means if your opponent has a bunch of characters on their board and they're exerted you can use it to surprise your opponent with favorable trades and then once Cricky's done that job he quests for three lore so you can put on a lot of pressure just by having him on board gaining three lore every turn if your opponent doesn't have a way to banish it mm -hmm. it is a lucky bug we do see an Ariel Spectacular Singer played this turn as well, I believe, to look at the top four cards of Zach's deck and then put one in hand if he finds one. And then we see a Sir Hiss. This is an yes. interesting card we don't normally see. No, this is. I, it doesn't synergize with much else in the deck, but it is a turn two play that he can play uh, on curve, and it's evasive, so probably an answer for Diablo in the meta. Yes, there. yeah, it has three strength, only one willpower, but enough strength to banish a Diablo, even a Diablo that's had a hidden cove. Hidden cove, I was yeah, say. yeah, we see a lot of hidden coves being played in uh, Emerald Steel, so it still gets around that as well. And then a pretty great two drop, like you mentioned, being able to quest for one every turn. If your characters don't have evasive, you can't challenge other evasive characters, so just adding a little bit of extra pressure. Yes. Now, Shane here, uh, using some of his, uh, of course, uh, Zach pointing out there that his, uh, Mickey has, uh, or Shane pointing out Mickey has resist, so not taking any damage there because uh, of the Cogsworth, but uh, Shane trying to remove as much lore as possible from Zach's side of the board. Zach is, is threatening to run away with this game here, uh, particularly with that three lore Cricky on the board. Yeah, unfortunately for Shane, we still haven't found much of a card draw option, but these two Cogsworth in play are giving everything else resist plus one. They're not giving themselves resist plus one, but each Cogsworth is giving the other one resist plus one. And so it creates an interesting thing here where Cogsworth allows you to make favorable trades. You see how wide Zach is going. So Shane really needs to challenge a bunch of the characters to bring them down, especially since we're not finding cards like Grab Your Sword, or at least we found them earlier, and then Zach was able to get rid of them with some of the song removal cards that he has available to them. Unfortunately for Shane, though, the Mickey and the Cogsworth, they don't have a lot of strength. And so... For some of the characters in on Zach's side of the board are evasive with the Diablos and the Sir Hiss, uh, but also these Crickies, you know, the, those Crickies have four willpower, so it takes a bit of challenging with these characters that don't have a ton of strength just to get rid of a couple threats. We see another Cricky being played here as well. I mean, just those two Crickies are six lore on board. Zach's already at 14 lore. If Shane doesn't have an answer to this, the game may be over. going to see what Shane is uh, looking at. Okay, so Shane does find the whole new world. I think he sings it with Cogsworth. This is honestly exactly what he needed. You don't love singing a whole new world when there's a Diablo in play because uh, the Diablo lets uh, Zach draw a card for every card that Shane draws. So Zach has to discard his hand, draw seven from the whole new world, and then he gets basically seven instances of deciding if he wants to draw an extra card for all seven cards that Shane drew. And we see Zach just filling up his hand with cards. He should have close to a 14-card hand here after the whole new world. But it's something Shane had to do in order to have a chance of getting back into this game. Right. I mean, you have to play to your outs, right? And that is his out. 
um, whether or not it helps his opponents, what he needed to do. The bummer for Shane is, uh, you know, this deck likes to uh, take advantage of a whole new world by having a lot more resources at, at its disposal when it does it uh, than your opponent. So in theory, Shane would love to have a lot more ink in his inkwell to be able to do more than Zach with those cards that he gave him. Um, but because of that discard in the early game, just wasn't able to generate that resource advantage. Unfortunately, I don't think Shane found what he wanted to with that whole new world. We see him play two popsicles. And I mean, when Zach has 14 cards in hand, what's an extra two? You, you know, yeah, right? you're, you're playing the popsicles, letting him draw off the Diablo. At this point, Shane just has to find his out. Yeah, that's true. And, and there are some things available. Uh, grab your sword, but didn't find it. And there it is. Um, grab your sword would have helped. Okay, both players seem to have finished their altar. Like I said, I think Shane gets to go first in this game. We see him inking a Rise of the Titans. Doesn't need that for this matchup. Nope. And playing a Popsicle, a very stereotypical Sapphire opening. Popsicle is a fantastic card. I love this I love this card, to be honest with you. It's just, there's something about it being so simple. It's a one-cost item. You play it, you draw a card. It basically makes your 60-card deck a 56-card deck. Mm-hmm. All right, so we did see game one. Zach played the Diablo on turn one. It was a turn one play. No turn one play here. Uh, so a Ford of Sphere going in on Shane's side, um, followed by a Smee on turn two. Smee, a very popular card after his release. Um, very well statted for a turn two play. And two lore allows you to either put a little board pressure on if your opponent um, is playing aggressively or get you two, four, or six lore um, right off the bat. I think this is a powerful play from Shane, especially since Zach missed his one drop. You know that Smee's likely going to be able to quest on this turn, gain two lore. We do see an Ursula Deceiver being played that's going to hit a Let It Go because it's the only uh, song in Shane's hand. But it's already starting. This hand targeting, especially the songs, uh, is happening on Zach's end. But Smee has lots of strength. If Shane decides to quest with the Smee, he's going to gain two lore. And then also, if Zach decides to challenge with the Ursula, which he probably won't because it wouldn't trade with the Smee, the Smee would banish the Ursula in return. Beast Hardheaded going into the Inkwell. Another card that won't do a lot of good uh, this match, potentially, um, into a Fishbone Quill on turn three. You know, this is one of the challenges that Shane has in this with this deck, though, with this build. Uh, Fishbone Quill is a card that allows you to ink an extra card out of your hand every single turn. Uh, but it's using the cards in your hand to do it. And uh, when you're playing a deck like Zax, which seems to want to force you to discard, uh, you know, maybe a card a turn um, through the first two or three or four turns, um, that's a tough decision to make. Yeah, sometimes with these Sapphire Steel decks, I've noticed players like to lean towards a certain ramp option. There's Fishbone Quill, which you see in the majority of Sapphire decks. And then depending on the Sapphire deck, some people like to play One Jump Ahead, which is a two-cost song. You can play it, take the top card from your deck, putting it into the inkwell, or you can play Mickey Mouse Detective, which does the exact same thing, but it's three ink, uninkable, and one three. So I think Shane in this scenario would rather see the Mickey Mouse Detective for a couple reasons. We have the emerald and the amber um, aggression to hand of targeting not only songs, but through cards like the Bear Necessities, targeting item cards as well. So to get around having to discard a Fishbone Quill or One Jump Ahead, uh, a Mickey Mouse Detective would be a perfect card in this scenario, being able to play it, still doing what Fishbone is trying to do in this case, which is, which is I think, just getting Shane to five inks so that you can play a five or six ink character. Mm. And I think uh, with those two cards, talking about hand pressure here, Zach has just managed to empty Shane's hand. Shane forced to discard that Hiram Flavisham, which he really wanted to play this turn <laughs> yeah. to recharge his hand and keep him going. So Shane in full top deck mode here. Yeah, the Hiram Flavisham could have kept Shane in this game. I mean, the game's not over by any means. Of course. But uh, Shane not having any cards in hand and playing a deck that has some pretty expensive cards, he's going to be forced to either play this card every that he draws every turn or draw a card. The Hiram Flavisham could alleviate that a lot. I think Zach has a great understanding of that and knowing, okay, I won't develop a character this turn. Shane doesn't have very many ca characters on his side of the board, just the Mr. Smee. I don't have to worry about the Mr. Smee that much because it's not going to gain uh, a ton of lore over the course of the game unless we heal it here with a Popsicle. And then now that Shane doesn't have any cards in hand, I have plenty of cards in my hand. I can start building a wide board and hopefully end this game quickly. Shane choosing to challenge the Ursula Deceiver removed there, and as you said, use the Popsicle to heal that damage. Shane or Smee would have removed himself at the end of that turn, <laughs> uh, being exerted. But 
Here's Ooh. another card. I was I was hoping we would see this card. I'm very excited. Uh, this is the Muses, uh, Proclaimers of Heroes. It is a 2-4 card with Ward, um, and it has an ability to gospel truth. Whenever you play a song, you may return chosen character with two or less strength, uh, chosen character with two strength or less to their player's hand. So I think this is going to be a very difficult card for Shane to answer, to be honest with you, because unlike an ink like Ruby that has access to cards that can get around Ward in a way, forcing your opponent to choose their character with Ward because characters with Ward can't be chosen uh, by their opponents, Shane's only options really to deal damage to these Muses is with cards like Grab Your Sword and Tinkerbell. Mm -hmm. Muses has four willpower, which is a lot. So even a Grab Your Sword and a Tinkerbell is not going to banish this card. And I don't, <laughs> I don't see Zach exerting the Muses anytime soon uh, for Shane to challenge. Not only that, but we've seen a couple of action cards and a couple uh, cards in general that reduce strength in Zach's deck. So I'm starting to see where this is headed, especially we mentioned painting the roses red in the previous game. Reducing strength works perfectly with the Muses so that anything that Shane plays that also doesn't have ward is just going to bounce right back into his hand in which he may have to discard <laughs> with the way that Zach's deck is playing out. Yeah, it's just it's it's a fascinating uh, card, and, and and one I'm really excited to see Zach make use of here. Um, we've seen several Zahungs in this deck already. Um, and another fun note: if you have cards with enter the enter play triggers, like let's say Aerial Spectacular Singer, um, the Muses allows you not only to bounce your opponent's cards, but potentially your own cards as well. Um, and so. Uh, playing a song could allow him to reuse that aerial to look yeah. for additional songs. Find those songs that he may need. Uh, we do see an aerial being played that has ward. This aerial gains an extra two lore if you have more items than your opponent does. And, of course, Shane has three items to Zach's zero. So this aerial can be questing for five lore basically untouched for the same reason that the muses are going to be a problem for Shane. Zach likely doesn't have an answer for aerial until aerial is exerted and can be challenged. So that play we just talked about, Zach choosing to do that exact thing. Um, you know, Ariel, I, or was it um, someone sang, uh, we don't talk about Bruno. Ariel's spectacular <laughs> singer. It's five costs using your singer five ability. Saying we don't talk about Bruno. And then uh, Zach choosing to use the muses, muses to return Ariel back to his hand and then able to use that enter play trigger again. Yeah, there's definitely going to be a lot of cycling here I can see in Zach's future. Being able to play Aerial Spectacular Singer, find those extra song cards that have been doing a ton of work, you know, ripping cards out of Shane's hand, uh, also removing some characters. Like, we don't talk about Bruno is a great card for this, especially when Shane is at no cards in hand. We don't talk about Bruno is essentially a banished character card because there's no other card to randomly discard when it returns to your hand. Yeah, Shane, in an unfortunate situation there, you can see he uh, thought about using... Uh, along came Zeus to take care of the Muses, but unfortunately, Zach with two cards on the board <laughs> with Ward. With Ward, yeah. Uh, so nothing targetable there, or choosable. Can't choose any of them, and I'm sure Shane knows that if he keeps along came Zeus in his hand, it's very likely to just be discarded the next turn, so opts to use his Fishbone Quill and at least put it into his Inkwell, giving him a little bit of extra ink to work on for whatever Shane top decks. Oh, and then we did see Cricky coming in here using that uh, ability we talked about earlier to increase the strength of his characters, making Muse able to challenge and remove that aerial item collector. Cricky is such a strong card, man. I feel like it comes out of nowhere. Unless you're expecting it, it's super hard to play around because it, you just don't normally see this card. We've seen it a couple times today. People have been teching it in to just have these surprise turns where you play the Cricky and then can trade with something that they weren't expecting, getting rid of that aerial, which otherwise would be difficult to get rid of with just the characters that Zach had on board. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Cricky does not have Ward. So Shane, <laughs> finally with the target for that along came Zeus, hurls a Thunderbolt and uh, takes that off the board. Which is great because Cricky does quest for a lot of lore. It would be a lot of pressure that Zach was putting on with just the Cricky. I'm sure you don't want to quest with Prince John or the Muses. You can probably get away with it when Shane doesn't have any characters in play because, again, they have wards. They can't be targeted. But if Shane does get any characters in play, you may not want to exert them because Prince John is drawing you cards when Shane's discarding cards. And like you've mentioned earlier, with the Muses, you're able to cycle those aerials or also use it as a removal option if you need to for anything that Shane plays. Yeah, Prince John here. Um, another card that we saw, I think, quite a bit uh, around set two when this kind of discard... Uh, engine we saw get going with Bucky and Prince John, but kind of fell out of favor. Uh, Zach bringing it back here uh, and using it. Um, and as you said, whenever uh, Shane discards a card at this point, uh, Zach will be able to draw two cards. 
Shane was pretty fortunate in finding a whole new world yes. off the top of the deck, immediately playing it, knowing that this is what he needs to find to get back in this deck. Both players had to discard their hand and then draw seven cards. I don't think Zach got to draw any extra cards from the Prince John because Shane didn't have any cards in hand. So both of these players have a fresh hand of seven cards. We'll see what Shane can do with it. Being able to ink for turn and ink with the Fishbone Quill, I think should have four ink total to work with on this turn. Yeah, that was the way back into this game, especially having the Fishbone Quill allowing you to, to continue to ramp your resources now that you have these extra cards in your hand. That's what Shane needs to do. Um, unfortunately for him, he uh, used a lot of ink to do that, and uh, Zach is showing six uh, lore on the board, and has already climbed his way up to six, so going to start putting pressure on there. Um, but speaking of lore pressure... Uh, we have Bell Strange but Special. Yes, I think this is going to turn into a race. Sapphire is notorious for finding a card like Lucky Dime and then using a card like Bell or the Aerials or Tamatoa to come out of nowhere and gain a ton of lore very quickly. Zach is threatening a lot of lore through his characters, which I think Zach could win in the next turn or two if nothing changed about the board state. But if Shane has 10 ink in his inkwell, this Bell is going to be questing for 5 lore. It may not be questing very much because you don't want uh, Zach to challenge any uh, the the bell and discard oh, we it. Do oh, we, we do see the dime. We see the dime. dime. So Zach has a very interesting decision here. Any of these cards can be banished. He has to consider banishing the Fortisphere, the Baboom, or the Lucky Dime because Bare Necessities lets him banish a non-character card. And he opts for the Lucky Dime knowing that Shane could play it next turn and immediately gain a 5 lore off of Bell. And then so long as Dime is in play, he has to be worried of mm -hmm. another Bell being played, an Ariel being played, or a Tomato being played, and Shane sweeping the game out from under him. Absolutely. I mean, with the amount of ink on the board, that Dime is potentially a two-turn clock, able to uh, enabling Shane to get 10 lore uh, next turn just after the Diamond Bell alone. And in that case, Shane is one three lore character away from immediately dropping it and gaining um, or four lore characters, so another Bell or yes. Errol Item Collector away from winning the game. So a uh, crucial hit there off that Be Prepared. Yeah, crucial. I'm sorry, uh, Bare Necessities. Uh, bare Necessities, yeah. yeah. The Zach, other B-Song. <laughs> Zach played another Bare Necessities after that and discarded the Fortisphere and then I think played a... Uh, You've you forgotten, forgotten me. me. <laughs> yeah. So gets rid of Shane's entire hand in uh, this, this. And a double draw of Prince John every time. Yeah. So Zach has a full hand. Zach, or sorry, Zach has a full hand. Shane does not have a hand again, even after having found that whole new world. Yeah. I, I, Zach is cycling through a lot of cards. Is that all of his cards in his hand? I, he looks like he's holding a stack. I believe so. I was trying to figure <laughs> out if it was a discard pile for a moment. But. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like too many cards to have in your hand at once. It's sort of crazy. Yeah. No, that's great. So Zach now, with five lore showing in the board, is sitting at 10, so two turns away. Of course, Shane, with plenty of removal options, I don't think we've seen Grab Your Swords yet. I don't think so. I don't think he's found one to be discarded. The, the unfortunate thing, though, is even if Shane does find a Grab Your Swords, he play, let's say he finds one, plays it next turn, Look at all the cards in Zach's hand. So many He's cards. He's just going to throw down a bunch more cards that you're going to then need another answer for. And I think, I mean, when you have that many options, Zach has to take a second to look through all of the cards available to him. What's the best play? He decides to play an Aerial Spectacular Singer, look at the top four of his cards, finding a sudden chill, and then putting that in hand. Just another song that can be sung to activate the muses if he wants to. Yeah, no, this is a really challenging position. I think at this point, maybe you're hoping for another whole new world uh, for yes. Zach to dump everything in the hand um, and then draw seven new cards. We do not find that. We have a Mickey, uh, which we would have liked to see earlier game, but uh, continuing to build that resource advantage. I but think... I think we're going to have one more turn here for Shane to find the whole new world. I think you said it perfectly. Ditch, forcing Zach to ditch all of those cards. You getting a fresh seven cards. Zach gets a fresh seven cards, but uh, that's a lot better than however many cards he has in hand right now. And then you're just going to have to claw your way back after. I'm assuming Zach is going to quest for, I mean, at least four lore this turn. Mm -hmm. Probably the full, Probably the full amount. We'll see. Yeah, a whole new world into a grab your swords would be nice. Uh, but there it is, uh, six lore, bringing Zach up to 16, four lore away from victory. And Shane now uh, going to top deck here, see if he can find the answers. Another muse. I like what Zach's doing here, just playing out his characters, probably knowing that Shane's only out here is something like a whole new world, and then finding some sort of removal. And so just playing some high willpower characters that he'll have as a follow-up if Shane does find something to answer this board. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, playing that Kita there, an interesting choice, but it does give you a five willpower character on the board. Um, and we did not drop. We drew uh, Rise of the Titans. That's not what we needed. And uh, wow. Those are some quick games. Those are some very quick games, some spicy games, some fun games.